Benoit. First of all, thank you very much for that, uh, that introduction. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here, although I have to admit that yesterday I was a bit shocked to discover how many economists there were here and how many Canadian economists there were here. So, of course, I have to note that I'm an American sociologist. Um, and um, although I will be talking a lot about the United States, I will also bring in some work I have done on uh, Canada. So how is what I'm going to do different from what you've been hearing? Obviously, it's sociological and demographic. Um, one thing I think that makes it different from a lot of work on immigration is that my interest is, real, is as much in the impact of immigration on the larger society as it is on the impact of the larger society on the immigrants and their uh, descendants. And I hope to convince you that I've identified uh, some impacts. And I also um, don't focus exclusively on the immigrants, but I also include their descendants because that's where we begin to really um, see uh, some of those impacts. So, um, I have to acknowledge that you know, obviously I'm not just doing this work all by myself. I've had a lot of assistance from some of the CUNY graduate students who have done a lot of the data work for me, Doigu Basaran Sahin and Brendan Burke, who's now finished and gone on to Florida. And also I've been working on Canada with Jeffrey Wrights, um, who is probably known to many of you, a sociologist um, at the University of uh, Toronto. Okay, so again, I'm going to be emphasizing the U.S. patterns. That's where I've done a lot of work and where I think, in fact, there's a lot of data that bears on what I'm going to uh, look at. Um, and, uh, I, but I will bring in Canada. I'm going to begin with um, something that I now have been disputing for several years in, in print, namely the U.S. population projections, which have played a really important role, I think, in the overall atmosphere, political and cultural, around um, immigration. As you may know, um, those projections suggest that whites will become a demographic minority of the population in the not too distant future. And I'm going to directly challenge that and say that those projections don't comprehend the assimilatory changes that are taking place that are bringing people of partly or even wholly non-white origins into what we could call um, a white mainstream. So by using the projections, I'm also then going to be um, looking at alternative futures. If we reconsider certain key population groups, what future do we envision as a consequence? And I think this brings out, uh, in, to my mind, very clearly um, the rather substantial impact in the long run of some of the changes that we see taking place today. So um, just to quickly review, so the population projections, which are developed by the U.S. Census Bureau, um, are um, uh, projecting that before the middle of this century, that whites or in technical lingo, non-Hispanic whites, people of European descent in the United States, are going to form a minority of uh, the American population, although they have been the majority, of course, from the beginnings of the American nation. And, but look here in the quotation at how a minority group is defined, and this is going to become very important in my leverage. Um, so a minority group is described as anything other than non-Hispanic white alone. So that means if you are non-Hispanic mixed race, you are a member of a minority group according to this. And um, if you are part Hispanic and part non-Hispanic white, because of the way the census treats people who report his, any Hispanic origin, you're also a member of a minority because you're not um, non-Hispanic. So the Census Bureau redoes the projections about every two years, and in 2017, um, the projection showed this transition point to an, uh, a so-called majority-minority society, all minorities, in other words, numerically, uh, 
um, as being reached by uh, 2045. And it's useful just to show kind of how this operates. So, wait, the kind of, okay, so here's white race only, no other race, non Hispanic. So, if we follow this line along here, um, we get out to 2045, and the percent, uh, that group is now 49.75% of the population according to the projections, and so, aha, many analysts have said, therefore, that, uh, by that date, approximately, um, we will have a majority-minority society. Now, one indication of the difficulties here is the number of non-Hispanics with two or more races, and I can tell you from analyzing the more detailed level of the projections, the vast majority of these people reporting two or more races are partly white. Um, but you can see that um, this group is growing. Um, it doesn't look very big, uh, perhaps, to you, but that's partly because this line is the people anticipated as reporting two or more races in any given year. It actually reflects a larger population um, that manifests itself in, it has, has um, there's a larger population of people of two or more races. And you'll see that the way the people in this group identify means that sometimes they report themselves as mixed and sometimes they report themselves as of single race. There's a lot of uh, one demographer called a churning that involves the mixed race population. I'll just assert also, and you'll see later why I'm asserting this, that there's also a mixed population of, that is largely of European ancestry and also Hispanic ancestry in this group, but because of census coding rules, given the, the way the data appear in the census, um, the, these people are treated as solely Hispanic once they report being having any um, Hispanic descent. Okay, so um, this idea of the mixed majority minority society I think one could say is having a very large impact in the broader society, in its politics, um, in its culture. Um, I, I, I don't, I, I'm sure you're as interested in the Trump phenomenon as we Americans are. And so now there's a lot of analysis coming out of political science about the support for Trump. And um, many uh, political scientists are fingering what they call racial anxiety. Um, and so this is the, the fear of many whites that they are losing dominance in American society because, in part, of the demographic changes that they see taking place there. Um, even on the, and on the very far right, we see that um, racist groups are recruiting on the basis that white dominance um, in the U.S. is endangered. On the far other side of the spectrum, there are many multicultural progressives who are also welcoming what they see as the end of white America, the end of white cultural dominance, perhaps the end of white um, political dominance, um, and then sort of adding to the, if you will, the academic support uh, for the position I'm, uh, I'm espousing here, there's now a broad stream of social psychological research. The leading figure is a social psychologist named Jennifer Richardson, who, uh, who is at Yale. And this shows that whites, when prompted by scenarios of demographic change, tend to adopt more conservative attitudes politically um, and also express harsher attitudes toward uh, minority uh, group. So this is, you know, I don't want to over exaggerate the importance of the idea. It's not as if changing it is going to revolutionize our politics, but it is part of a kind of political miasma, you might say, in the United States that has caused many whites, especially whites without college degrees, um, to support Trump and to support conservative immigration policies and conservative policies more generally. Okay. Let's draw back for a moment now. So I've sort of set the stage. 
but I want to like look at some of the big forces that are operating in American society that may in fact be bringing about a rather different set of outcomes than are anticipated in the population projections. And one of those big forces, which is also operating in Canada, is in fact demographic shift, but it's a very precise kind of demographic shift that one could argue opens up opportunities for immigrant minorities in particular to be mobile. And so it's a conjunction of two big, big things. One is the baby boom. So the baby boom, which you had in Canada too, in the United States was born between 1946 and 1964, probably roughly the same years here. Huge group, largely white, you know, overwhelmingly really white, native born white, um, uh, the, probably the first group to truly experience mass higher education, you know, very well placed in the labor market, but now aging and leaving the workforce, leaving the ages of civic uh, activity. And so over the next two decades, basically they'll all be gone from, from the workforce. Um, at the same time, moving into the ages of work are the much more diverse youth cohorts that have um, many immigrants and especially many children of immigrants um, <coughs> in them. So the the, the dilemma here for a society like Canada or the US is that these societies have recruited the top of their workforce, people in elite positions, overwhelmingly from white men. And um, that group is shrinking, or at least the group that's shrinking is of men who are exclusively of European descent. So what is going to happen then as the baby boom exits and positions open up? Just to show you the demography in the US, um, maybe I'll just focus on the top population pyramid, which is as measured in 2010. And um, the colors that I've added here, the red indicates non-Hispanic whites as defined by the Census Bureau, and the blue indicates everybody else. So you can see that the red bars are very wide in the Middle Ages, which is where the baby boom was located in 2010. There's this big bulge that's working its way through the, uh, through the age hierarchy. And so in the next uh, 20 years, those people are going to all become, well, they'll be mainly 65 or older. And of course, m many of them will be leaving the labor market. Um, and no group behind them contains as many whites. Um, and indeed, uh, coming up behind them, obviously, are uh, age groups that are much more evenly balanced between uh, non-Hispanic whites uh, and others. And a, you know, a, not quite as stark a picture, but a similar picture um, obtains in Canada, where we have projections between 2006 and 2031, um, and you can see that the projection of the visible minority population is anticipated to grow substantially um, in, the, in the ages of, of uh, in work, people of working ages. And I, I don't have quite the same uh, population pyramid, but certainly um, what's also accompanying this is a shrinking in the absolute size of the white Canadian population in younger age groups. So again, there's this problem of not enough people from the historical base of recruitment for top positions to replace all of the people in the baby boom who are going to be leaving. So this would lead you to think that there ought to be changes taking place even now at the top of the workforce that it can't be quite as white as it has been historically. And, um, oh, well, let me skip this for the moment. I'll go on to this one. Well, that's true. And so this is from the US, um, and I have defined the top quartile of jobs by the, uh, the incomes of specific occupations. So in other words, I rank occupations, 
by the median income of their full-time all-year-round workers, and I know how many people there are in each occupation, and I count down that ranking of occupations until I get to a quarter of the workforce, and that's the top quartile. So, and I've done this for 2000, for 2010, uh, for 2015. So if we read from right to left, and then from top to bottom, we see first the changes across cohorts. Then we see second, how those cohorts change over time. And the percentage in each case is the percent of the cohort in the top quartile that is non-Hispanic white. So you can see over on the far right, um, this is from 2000, it's older workers, and you can see this undoubtedly states what was true in the second half of the 20th century, that whites basically monopolized the top quartile of jobs. They were 90, almost 90% <coughs> of the workers. And when we come to the baby boom, um, well, it's not quite as strong a monopoly, but it's still a very strong position of dominance because more than 80% of the, of the baby boom cohorts um, in these top jobs are non-Hispanic whites, and it doesn't change very much over time. But once we get past the baby boom cohorts, we start to see changes. So among the younger workers, um, if, uh, you can see that we go from 77% non-Hispanic white then to 69% non-Hispanic white then to 68% non-Hispanic white. And not only that, but over time, the white percentage um, in these top jobs for that cohort is declining. So we can see then that there really is growing diversity at the top of the workforce in jobs that are not only well remunerated, but they also are jobs that often carry a great deal of uh, authority. So, okay, let me go back a bit. Um, wait, can I, oh no, okay, I'll get there in a second. Okay, so, so the argument I'm gonna make in part says that the demographic changes that are taking place in the North American societies um, allow for a certain degree of mobility of, from immigrant minorities into top positions. Um, and that um, we can think of this as kind of a, maybe a weakening of the boundaries that separate the most powerful group in each of these societies, namely the, the white males, from, from others. Um, and a reason I would argue for this is we can think of this as a kind of non-zero-sum mobility in the sense that for somebody from a minority to move up, it's not required that somebody from the majority moves down because these positions are being vacated and there are not enough whites with the right talents and credentials to fill them. And so therefore they're being filled from other groups um, in the society. So this is a situation that one would think diminishes somewhat the conflicts among groups that would attend the dominant group being challenged um, in, in, in these positions. Okay, so who's in the US, who's benefiting from this mobility? Well, the basic story here is that it is immigrant minorities that are benefiting. It is not black Americans, the group that, you know, obviously did not arrive in the United States through uh, any form of voluntary immigration. So, in under, so this chart, you read from left to right, and in understanding the color coding, um, the light tint of a given color is the foreign born, the dark tint is the native born. So to take the very bottom, so that's blue is for um, black Americans, and you can see that there's a bit of a change over time in the representation of black Americans in the top quartile, but it's not that dramatic. And in fact, by the time we reach the youngest age group, there's a bit of a dip downward in terms of their representation. And that representation is mainly because of native born blacks, not because of immigrant blacks. So the big changes are taking place in the other two broad defined populations, Asians, in the green colors, and notice the very strong immigrant Asian presence 
in, in the top jobs, which is partly a function of the demography of Asians because the great majority of adult Asians in the United States are still foreign born. That's changing over time. Also, Latinos, which is a bit of a surprise, are increasing their representation rather dramatically over time. And in this case, it's not so much the immigrant Latinos as the native born Latinos. And they, you can see that's, that's the dark tan or dark orange and the size of the bar grows very strongly as we move from left to right. So indeed, the top of the workforce is becoming more diverse and the people who are moving up are people of recent immigrant origins, Asians and Latinos particularly. Okay, so we see there's mobility. I don't mean to imply, by the way, that inequalities among these groups aren't very strong. The chances of a Latino moving into a top position are lower, obviously, than those of a white, but this is still real. I mean, people are moving up, they're taking jobs with authority. It, could, it probably means there'll be further changes um, down the road. But now I wanna look at some other related effects. So we have immigrant minorities, especially moving upward. They're moving into settings where there are many whites. These are schools, these are neighborhoods, these are jobs. And therefore, um, it's not surprising that other kinds of relationships are forming across these boundaries. And in particular, um, that we have a, a rise, a sharp rise in the number of mixed families. A family where one partner is non-Hispanic white and the other partner is minority. And I'm gonna focus a lot on the children of these unions because I argue that it's through the children and how they're located that we really get a sense of the difference that mixed unions are, are making. So how big a change is this? Well, okay, here's the US. So in the US, you know, as a puritanical society, we are still stuck with following marriages so rather than unions. So we have here intermarriages. Um, they are, have been calculated to be the intermarriages in the prior year. So it's among people currently marrying, how many are marrying across these major categories? And you can see that over the half century that's represented here, there's been a pretty sharp rise. So 1967 is a key date because that's when the Supreme Court in a very famous and wonderfully named decision called Loving v. Virginia um, dismissed or took off the books the remaining anti-miscegenation laws. These were state laws. So it really opened up the way for interracial marriage in the United States. And so you can see it was very low at that point, but it's been rising fairly steadily. It's 17% um, in 2015. It looks like it's going to continue to rise for some time, although obviously it's never going to be 100%. Um, is that true in Canada? Yes, it is true in Canada. And now, the Canadian situation, as Fang Ho has pointed out, differs because the population composition is different. And so in Canada, we have a smaller minority population than we have in the United States. So that has two sort of, I won't say them, call them obvious, but evident numerical implications. One is that because the minority groups are smaller, they have higher rates of exogamy or higher rates of forming mixed unions because smaller groups generally are less um, endogamous. Um, the other is that because uh, the, the white population is so relatively large, a higher share of these unions are with whites. So in the US, it's about 80% of the intermarriages join a white and a, and a Hispanic or non-white partner. It's about 85% um, in Canada. What's also true, uh, there's a third implication, and that is that the overall share of intermarriages is higher in the US than it is in Canada. But again, this is really a function of the numbers, the, the composition, rather than of anything about the, the society um, itself. Okay, so. All right, so now we're gonna look at the mixed individuals. This is the US. Um, 
So these data come from the American Community Survey. And what I and my students have done is we have identified infants. Infants because um, you have the greatest possibility of finding two parents in the household when there are infants. And you'd be surprised at how many households with infants don't have two parents, but 75% do. So what we wanted to do was to look to define mixing based on the ethno-racial origins of the parents rather than what they report about the child, which is often partial rather than complete. So, okay, so we found then that um, you could say 14 to 15% of infants are mixed in 2013. Almost 80% of those mixtures involve a white parent and uh, a non-white parent. And it's not so much mixed race, which is what everybody thinks of when they think of mixing in the US. So, you know, uh, emblematic of, of mixtures have been indiv uh, individuals who have a black parent and a white parent, but you can see they're not a big group, nor are people who have an Asian parent and a white parent. The biggest group by far is the people who have a, an Anglo parent, an Anglo white parent and a Hispanic parent. They're a relatively hidden group because of the way the Census Bureau uh, collects and codes data. Um, also interesting here is the white and mixed group. So you have a lot of whites who are ma marrying people who are of mixed race, which means they're partly white. And you'll see why uh, that will be when I discuss the characteristics of mixed individuals. Okay, now most individuals who are mixed will be coded by the Census Bureau as minorities. Because if their mixture is reported, they are, if it's mixed race, well, they're not solely white. If it's mixed Hispanic and non-Hispanic, well, they're Hispanic. Um, so, uh, so this is a very odd situation, reminiscent of the so-called one drop rule in American life, where an individual who had any visible non-white ancestry was treated as, as non-white. This is sort of his, history, really. This was the late 19th, early 20th centuries. But the Census Bureau is continuing this tradition, one might say, in the way it deals with mixed individuals. So, um, in fact, the mixed individuals are the pivot in the projections, as I'll show you in a moment. So, um, and one ought to reflect on this a bit. So, so as I mentioned, the, you know, the one drop rule seems to have been revived um, in census data, but also very important here, I think, is a kind of binary thinking. So, and it has to do with placing people in categories and the discomfort with placing people in more than one category. So, you know, you have to be white or you have to be non-white. Well, but what about people who are partly white and partly um, minority? And so, because of the failure to deal with the complexities of this mixing, the population projections wind up exaggerating the decline of the white population, exaggerating the growth of the so-called minority population, and hastening um, the point to a majority-minority society. So let's see how that works. So here are some alternative futures kind of revising the projections by considering some mixed individuals as, as part of the white population, which they can be some of the time. So um, the blue bar is the Census Bureau projection, and you can see it crosses uh, the 50% mark at 2045. So then I say, well, okay, let's take out, let's put in individuals who are white and non-white. Not, not not, they're not Hispanic, they're non-Hispanic of mixed race, but partly white. That's the red line puts them in. And you can see now that the moment, it still crosses the 50% line, but 10 years later than it does in the official projections. Okay, it's, we cannot, it, with census data, directly 
identify the size of the mixed Anglo and Hispanic group because there is no way in the current census scheme of ethnicity and race to report and have it recorded that you are partly Hispanic and partly non-Hispanic. So we have to kind of make an estimate, a reasonable estimate. And we have a census uh, survey uh, which was conducted for the purpose of developing an alternative question. And so they had a unified question which had Hispanic as equivalent to a race category and allowed people to identify as many categories as they wanted. And we know from that that about 15% of Hispanics would say they are white also, if they could. And the Census Bureau did follow-up interviews with individuals. So they say, based on those interviews, that these are meaningful, these designations, that people really thought of themselves as, as partly white. So, that's, so what I've done is I've said, reading those data, a very conservative estimate then of, of how many people are both white and Hispanic is one that's about the same size as the non-Hispanics of mixed race. That's conservative. It, it really understates, very likely, the true size. But, so that's the green bar. We add those people in, and now you see, okay, it's decreasing, but it doesn't, within the time frame of the projection, which takes, goes out to 2060, reach the 50% mark. Now, of course, you say, but it's decreasing, Alba. You know, like, hey, come on. It's going to get there eventually, isn't it? Well, maybe and maybe not. So let's look at a younger age group. So these young people, and they are overwhelmingly young, young people of mixed background are concentrated, you know, at the lower end of the age spectrum. Um, and so when we look at the whole population in a way we're kind of diluting their impact. So this looks at infants and it says, okay, let's do the same exercise of adding back in these groups that are partly white and therefore could be considered to be part of the white population. Well, now you can see the, the differences among the lines is much bigger. And so the Census Bureau projection has white children as non-Hispanic white children as diminishing to a third of infants by 2060. But when you add in um, the people who are partly white by race and people who are partly white and partly Hispanic, <clears throat> you can see that there, yeah, there's a decline in the line, but it is really not very sharp. And even by 2060, that whites are a clear majority um, among infants. So, <clears throat> okay, so obviously this raises the question of what do we know about people of mixed background? <clears throat> and so um, I would say that a lot of what we know comes from US studies, um, but I think we're beginning to get Canadian studies. Jeff Wrights and I are engaged in such a study, which I'll tell you a little bit about here. Um, and so, uh, so, I mean, our knowledge is, I want to say, piecemeal, and it's certainly not complete. We have census data, but census data are imperfect because mixtures are not fully reported. Um, and so that brings up a fundamental issue of selectivity, like who particularly is appearing as mixed in the census. So some, I'd say, sounder studies have gotten around this by doing ancestry tracing, asking a respondent, well, you know, what was the background of your mother? What was the background of your father? And kind of getting a more complete picture of the, the ethno-racial ancestry um, of the respondent. So I'm gonna divide up our, our, uh, this picture looking, I'll first look at children, then I'll look at adults in terms of their social affiliations, um, their um, social identities, and their experiences. So, um, okay, so using the infants that um, I and my graduate students identified in 2013, we also looked at characteristics of the family settings of those infants, like what is the income of those families? What kind of place um, do they reside in? And the basic story is that the individuals who are mixed look more like 
individuals in all white families than they do li like individuals in all uh, minority families. So their incomes are, are typically much higher um, than the, the incomes of the corresponding minority families. And they tend to be in the kinds of residential spaces um, like suburban homeowners um, where many whites are uh, also found. Um, the one big exception, um, and it's an exception that is very troubling and it's gonna come up again, are individuals who are in black white families. They do not look like whites. They look much more like minorities than they do like whites. Okay, what about social affiliations? Well, um, there's something called the Pew Survey of Multiracial Americans that's very helpful here. And so, and they asked a lot about, you know, do you feel accepted by whites? Do you feel accepted by whatever the group, the other group is in your background? Um, you know, who are your friends? What kind of neighborhood do you live in? So we have a fair amount of information then about the sort of social affiliations um, and experiences of these individuals. And again, this sustains a picture where the individuals who are mixed look more oriented toward whites than they do toward to the corresponding um, minorities. So, for example, white Asians think that whites are more accepting of them than Asians are. And um, they also have more white friends than they have Asian friends. And they live in neighborhoods that are more dominated by whites than they are dominated by uh, Asians. Again, black white individuals are exceptions, not to all of these statements, but to many of these statements. And their social affiliations are um, more oriented toward black Americans than they are toward uh, white Americans. So, and then the bottom line comes. So the marriage, who do these people marry? And um, so this seems to me very determinative because it's really telling us about the social milieus in which these individuals live because that's where they find their partners. And so they have very high rates of marriage to whites. So 70% basically, even uh, black white individuals have relatively high rates of marriage um, to whites. And um, in Canada, Jeff Wrights and I have found that the rates of marriage by mixed individuals to whites are exceedingly high. They're like 90%. Um, so all of this gives us a picture of individuals who for the most part um, are integrating kind of into social milieus where there are a lot of whites. They're mixing with whites. Um, and uh, the, but this may not be true. It isn't true to the same extent for individuals who are black and white in the US. Okay, um, so one sort of other relevant factor is experiences with prejudice, with discrimination. Um, and um, they, I mean, what this report makes clear is they have them. Um, everybody who's mixed has them to some extent, but they have different kinds of experiences depending upon um, the precise elements in their mixture. So, um, you know, so being subject to slurs or jokes. So that's something that's very common and is reported by what, you know, individuals who are white and Asian, individuals who are white and black, um, and so forth. However, um, only black, partly black individuals have negative interactions with the police at a very high rate. So this is a way in which the, if you will, the institutional and personal racism of American society really focuses on people who are visibly black as opposed to other people who may appear to have some non-white uh, uh, ancestry. And one of, so one of the very interesting studies by a young woman named Strimick Powell, if I'm saying her name correctly, she did you know, a sizable number of interviews with individuals who are Asian white and with individuals who are Asian black. And there are very big differences in the way they think about who they are in relationship to the society. So both individuals encounter 
various kinds of what are now called microaggressions in their daily life. But the Asian white individuals really sort of shrug them off. I mean, they don't think they're very important. They feel, as she puts it, white enough to be accepted. For the individuals who are black and white, the reaction is very, very different. No doubt the aggressions are very different too, but they see these as constituting a real barrier to their acceptance. They do not feel that they can be accepted, for the most part, in the mainstream uh, society. Okay, identities. Now, this is, I think, very important because it says, in effect, that there's a difference between membership in the mixed group and manifestation of mixture in data because the identities of mixed individuals are much more fluid than the identities of unmixed individuals. So that means that um, in the census, for example, sometimes they will be reported as mixed and sometimes they will re be reported as unmixed. A powerful demonstration of this comes in the very bottom uh, paragraph here. So um, Carolyn Liebler, who's at the University of Minnesota and a bunch of Census Bureau colleagues, good to see that the, in the US too, there can be collaboration um, between, between census staff and, and uh, academics. They analyzed a, a, a matched data set. They took the 20, 2000 census and the 2010 census and they tried to match individuals and they matched about half of all individuals. And then they looked at how are these individuals reported in 2000 and how are they reported in 2010? There was a lot of, a lot of discrepancy, but mainly uh, as I read their results, they don't quite say this, but this is my reading. It really has to do with people of mixed background who can appear mixed in one year and unmixed in the other. Now, of course, we don't know, you know, is it, are they doing the reporting? Is someone in their household doing the reporting? But this is simply the way things are, that, that, uh, that there's a lot of churning in the identities of these individuals. We also have a new, a, a recent study from Pew, um, the Pew study of Hispanic identity, which shows, and they did identity tracing to identify Hispanics. And they found that there's a sizable percent of Hispanics who no longer think of themselves as Hispanic. 11% just don't say they're Hispanic. And then another, uh, I can't remember, it might be a quarter, say most often that they're American rather than Hispanic. So identity fades, but it fades especially, they find, for the people who come from mixed family backgrounds. So, so mixture then is really identified with a weakening of identity, not an extinction necessarily, but a weakening of identity. Okay, come, what's going on here? Why? Pourquoi? Uh, pardon. <laughs> what is it doing to me? Why is it doing this? I did something bad, I'm sure. Okay, should work, right? Okay, yeah, okay. Um, this sort of summarizes what I've said. I won't reiterate everything, but um, one new piece of information is that in Canada, the data that Jeff and I are using allow us to look at incomes. And what we find is that there's basic parity when you control for a number of things between the incomes of mixed individuals and the incomes of Canadian whites, and that both are higher, therefore, than the incomes of Canadian um, visible minorities. So again, you know, evidence of a kind of integration of most people with mixed background into uh, the mainstream society. So, okay, so how should we make sense of this? So, um, so in the book, Remaking the American Mainstream, what Victor and I argue, uh, Victor Nee and I argue, is that a good way to think about assimilation is not the eradication of ethnicity, not 
the idea that the ethnics assimilate by becoming identical to people within a particular mainstream. This was the Milton Gordon idea that, you know, that if, if you remember his book, he had these wonderful names, Sylvanians, Mondovians. It sounded like it came out of a Duck Soup, you know, the famous Groucho, the famous Marx Brothers film. And the, whichever one was assimilating became identical to the other. The Mondovians became identical to the Sylvanians. No, that's not a reasonable way. It's not really even the historical experience in the United States or in Canada for that matter. But rather we think about there's a mainstream part of the society. It's the social, cultural settings where whites are at home. And other people begin to join that mainstream setting as we can, as we can see here. It doesn't mean, however, that they become identical in all ways to people who are in the same social milieu, whites who are in the same social milieu as they are. So what this allows for is the mainstream itself over time to become more diverse because um, there's more visible difference in ethno-racial origins among people who are in these settings. There are people joining these settings who assert um, minority identities. Um, and there's a parallel with the historical experience, I think, in both societies. I can't say I really know the Canadian one well, but I doubt it differs very much from the US one. So if we think back to the classical moment of mass assimilation on which a lot of this theorizing is based, namely the decades immediately following World War II in the US when the um, children and grandchildren of Southern and Eastern European immigrants who were marginalized up until that point joined the American mainstream. They didn't you know, abandon totally their identities, instead, they created hyphenated identities, which became very acceptable in mainstream America. And they didn't, most importantly, abandon their religions, even though their religions had also been marginalized in a society that before 1950 thought of its mainstream as white Protestant or white Christian. So now, suddenly, after World War II, we had a Judeo Christian mainstream. The very identity of the mainstream in religious terms um, changed. So I think there's an analogy that similar processes are occurring. Now they're not as large in magnitude. They're not sweeping as many people um, into the mainstream, but nevertheless, the mainstream is expanding. It's bringing in new people. Um, and it's also at the same time tolerating at least in some parts of the US. Geography is an important aspect of this that I really don't have time to deal with, but it's also tolerating more diversity um, within the mainstream. Okay, so the majority minority society, I'll just say I really think that this is a chimerical idea, and that's because most Americans, and I would include here a lot of demographers, imagine the majority minority society is going to somehow look like today, but with different numbers associated with the groups. So the groups will be as discrete and as distinctive as they are today, but their relative sizes will be different. I think that's really not a reasonable way to think about what's likely to happen in the future because um, the rise of these growing number of mixed young people is creating a lot of overlap between the groups. These are people who can, you know, they sometimes they think of themselves as white, sometimes they think of themselves as minority, sometimes they think of themselves as, um, as a combination of the two. They have social ties to relatives in each group. So the groups are becoming less discreet. They're blurring at the boundaries because of um, the rise of this mixed population. Um, and what that also means is that the groups are becoming internally more heterogeneous. So if we think of these mixed individuals as part of a minority population, well, their characteristics are really different from the rest of that minority population. They overlap a lot, obviously, with the white population. So 
you know. So the idea that we're going to have a majority minority society and therefore whites are going to be dominated by minorities really to me doesn't make much more sense, make a lot of sense. Um, you know, a lot of older whites think this, but they're not recognizing that it may be their grandchildren who are in the minority populations that they think are going to dominate uh, them. Okay, and so finally, I want to say this. So the, um, in the United States, certainly, if you believe the projections, the bulk of the population of mixed background is yet to be born. There are going to be large numbers born between now and 2060. It doesn't really make sense to think of the future as being demographically determined because the pivotal group is a group that has an ambiguous, a fundamentally ambiguous social location. I have relatives over here. I have relatives over there. Where, do I, where am I? Well, that's going to depend on sociological forces, how people are treated, you know, how well they do in the labor market, whether they can live in particular neighborhoods or not. Um, those could change. I mean, you know, we have a, uh, a, a president and administration now that is um, very hostile to non-whites. Well, maybe that could, I don't think it will happen, but that could affect the way whites treat non-whites, their willingness to enter into mixed unions, their willingness to accept young people who come from uh, mixed ethno-racial backgrounds. So that's what's going to determine the future, not uh, demography. And so we should, you know, we really need to move away from thinking that, um, well, it's absolutely certain that we're going to have a majority minority society by the middle of the 20th century. I hear even demographers say that, and it really makes me sad that they can't see through the data to see what social processes are really going on on the ground. But in any event, I'll stop there and I'm happy to take questions. <laughs>